Good e One, two, three. Yeah. Good evening, everyone. Could you uh, could you take your seats, please? We'll get the meeting underway. This is the November meeting of the of Renew, formerly known as the Alternative Technology Association. I see a lot of new faces along here. We hope it's going to be a, a great evening, and you're going to learn a lot. We've got stellar lineup tonight. We have three presenters. We have Finn Peacock of uh, Solar Quotes. We have Jerry, Jenny Paradiso of Suntrix, and we have Eddie May of NRG Solar. Each of them is going to give a presentation on a separate topic for about 10 minutes to start off, and after that we'll go to questions and answers. There'll be a microphone there that people will be asked to um, ask the questions from. However, if you don't want to um, stand at the, the mic, ask Catherine, who is at the very back there, for a pen and a piece of paper and write down your question and that will be given into the panel. So I think, um, I think without further ado, we'll begin with uh, Finn who will be talking about um, putting in batteries to an existing solar system with the current and the old feed-in uh, feed tariffs. So please welcome Finn. Got it. Hello. As Alan very nicely said, I'm uh, Finn Peacock, founder and CEO of a company called Solar Quotes, which since 2009 has uh, arranged quotes for almost one in 25 homes in Australia. Uh, I'm also the author of a book called The Good Solar Guide, which looks like that if anyone's interested. <laughs> it went to number one on Amazon for a while, so I was pretty happy with that, um, of all books sold in Australia on Amazon. So it's, it's, and we're raffling three copies, so three of you lucky people will have no problem getting to sleep tonight. <laughs> I'm gonna be re really quick, keep this really simple, because the answers are quite simple, I think. SA battery scheme, is it worth it? Got it, cool. So as Alan said, I'll go through um, very simple, some very simple numbers if you're, on, if you're a normal person on a normal feed-in tariff, if you're an old school person on the 44 cent feed-in tariff. So it's really very simple. So a 10 kilowatt hour battery, typical size, which will attract for most people a $5,000 rebate, $6,000 rebate if you have a concession card, I think. If you cycle it, and the, uh, <coughs> it will save you about $720 a year. And that's based on this today, the numbers today. So bearing in mind that we can't tell what's going to happen in the future. But as we stand, if you, you'd have to, to get $720 a year of savings, you'd have to cycle it 100% every day. So you'd have to be confident that you use 10 kilowatt hours essentially after the sun sets and before it rises. That's based on a 36 cent usage and a 16 cent feed-in tariff. If you're not getting at least a 16 cent feed-in tariff, swap your retailer. That's really easy to get in South Australia. And I'm sure you're all aware, to get the benefits of the battery, you have to subtract the feed-in tariff from the usage tariff because if you put the energy into the battery, you're deciding not to export it to the grid for a feed-in tariff. Is that everyone happy with that concept? Yeah, cool. Unless you're export limited, but we won't go into that. It's assuming that the battery is 100% efficient, which is a big assumption because no battery is 100% efficient. They're generally about 90, they generally the specs say they're about 90% efficient, but you do have to be careful if you're discharging them very slowly overnight, the fact that they have a standby load, you know, the electricity that they need to power their own systems, the efficiency can drop, and I've seen it down to about 70%. But I'm assuming 100% efficient battery and assuming that the battery doesn't degrade over the lifetime of the system. So there's some fairly optimistic assumptions. But if you want to save $720 in your first year, then you might want to consider getting a battery under the scheme if you're on an existing feed-in tariff. What about if you're on the 44 cent feed-in tariff? So that's, we always get asked this in South Australia. Do you 
kind of uh, get rid of the golden goose and go for the new thing, or do you keep the golden goose? Well, it's really very simple. First of all, the question I always ask is, are you getting at least 60 cents per kilowatt hour? Because I've noticed that a lot of people on the 44 cents aren't shopping around their retailer, and they're not getting the retailer feed-in tariff at all. So if you shop around, you can get an extra 20 cents, actually. So you should be able to get 64 cents a kilowatt hour and at least 60 cents. If you're not, change your retailer as a first priority. But let's assume you're getting what you should get for your feed-in tariff. Have a look at your bills over the last 12 months. You're all in the ATA, so you'll all know what you're exporting, and you'll all keep your bills, I'm sure. If add up all the kilowatt hours you've exported over the last 12 months, multiply them by 44 cents, because that's the extra benefit you get from being in the scheme. If that's worth less than $720, sorry, if that's worth more than $720, then a battery will not reduce your bills based on today's numbers. So bear that in mind. So that essentially, if you've got a, probably if you've got a three kilowatt system or above, you're going to struggle to reduce your bill any further with a battery. Because if you get the battery, you have to give up your 44 cent feed-in tariff. But if your 12 months worth of exports multiplied by the 44 cents are worth less than $720, then a battery might reduce your bill. What batteries are available? under the scheme? Well, at the moment, as I'm sure you're all aware, they have to be assembled in South Australia. And Sonnen was the first ones in to do a deal to assemble some batteries in South Australia. And Eddie and Jen will tell me if it's r this is right. But I think you, for about $12,000, you can get about a 10 kilowatt hour Sonnen after the rebate. Have I got those numbers right about that, give or take? Beware with Sonnen. I'll talk about backup a little bit later. If you want backup, you have to pay extra for that, and I think that's $1,500, $2,000 extra, something like that. So it's a good battery, but it's expensive. You know, simple maths based on today's numbers, about 17-year payback. A new one that was announced just the other day, Alpha ESS, for a 10 or 11 kilowatt hour battery. After the rebate, you're going to look at about seven and a half grand, so substantially cheaper. After January, I think you'll be seeing 10 kilowatt hour batteries with inverters for about $5,000. Eddie and Jen might disagree. I'm not saying they're going to be good batteries, but they'll have to be approved by the scheme. I think that's what we'll start to see looking at the pricing before the rebate. But all those numbers I talked about are based on what's happened to the numbers today, right now, 2018. What could change in the future that will, could change that $720 per year number up or down dramatically? Lots. The usage tariff could go up. The more expensive electricity is, the better the payback on batteries. But will the usage tariff go up? A lot of people are thinking that it will go down. Some people are saying it will go up. So much renewables coming in, that generally pushes the prices down, so I have no idea. Will the feed-in tariff go down? I have no idea. Probably. I think the feed-in tariff will go down. 20 cents is pretty generous at the moment. Will demand tariffs become compulsory? That will be a nightmare. That, a demand tariff is where you get charged based on the highest peak power you pull from the grid over three months, and they can be huge. That would really accelerate the payback of batteries if you can get the battery to bring your peak down. That will make batteries pay for themselves very quickly. If that happens, they're threatening it. Threatening it. I don't know if it'll happen. Will time of use tariffs become compulsory? I don't know. Again, a time of use tariff is good for batteries. Will standing charges change? Will they charge you more per day, whether you've got a battery or not? I have no idea. So if you've got a crystal ball, you've got to take all those into account as well. Now, the interesting thing with the subsidy is the rational way to approach that is to say, well, I'm worried about the feed-in tariffs going down. If the feed-in tariffs go down, then the battery becomes a lot more, I get a lot better payback on my battery. The rational thing to do is then buy the battery when the feed-in tariff goes down. Not buy the battery because you're scared it's going to go down. But because there's a, re uh, I call it a rebate, I should call it a subsidy. Because there's a $6,000, $5,000, $6,000 subsidy, that changes that logic. Because if you wait, you miss out on the $6,000, $5,000 subsidy. So that's interesting, isn't it? So I guess, you might be 
one way of looking at it is, and I think it's a valid way, is if the battery just pays for itself, no more, no less, that is actually quite cheap insurance against all these nasty things happening in the future. If you've got a 10 kilowatt hour battery, it's most people with an efficient house will have 90, 95% self-sufficiency. You're locking in a low bill for the next 10 years. Now, I wouldn't recommend you do that without the subsidy, but with the subsidy, that, that kind of logic starts to make sense. Does that make sense? Yeah, cool. So yeah, so maybe, it, maybe you look at it as a cheap insurance against changing tariffs and against an anarchic, crazy, messed up electricity market, which doesn't seem to be getting any better. And the other thing, just at the bottom there, is when you're doing the calculations, you know, you're looking at the $720 a year, think about what price you put on backup, and that's a very personal choice. So um, it was awesome in my street about three weeks ago, the whole, just our street went out. I don't know why, something to do with a transformer. And for four or five hours, I was the only street with lights because I've got a Tesla Powerwall, and um, that was priceless. I'm, it was just so nice. I was cycling down the street, the whole light was dark, and there was just this beacon of light, and it was my house. And it was, so I, I, reckon, I reckon that's worth a couple of thousand dollars. <laughs> I got some good photos and some good video. Um, but it's a very personal thing. Some people will put no price on it. Other people will put an enormous price on it. You know, maybe they've got critical things that maybe they have a lot of blackouts in their street. And then I think it's also valid to subtract that from the price of the battery before you do your payback calculations. But then, you know, that's up to you. So I think that's... That, those are my thoughts on the battery subsidy. Oh, yeah, this is interesting. Just some, if you want to hack the system, you may be able to do this. I'm not making any promises. AGL are currently offering a $3,000 10 kilowatt hour battery. It's LG Solar Edge. If you can claim the rebate, the subsidy on that in January, you'll be able to get that for free. And all the small print I've read says you will be able to do that if they approve Solar Edge LG Chem as one of the batteries. Simply Energy are currently offering a Powerwall 2 for $7,299. Because that's more than a 12 kilowatt hour battery, you should be able to claim a $6,000 subsidy on that so and I rang up Simply Energy to try and to see if I could get one and they said to me if the battery's approved and I can't see the Powerwall 2 not being approved as a battery for the scheme you should be able to claim the $6,000 on top of that so you might I'm not making any promises in January be able to get a Powerwall 2 from Simply Energy if you agree to be part of their VPP for $1,300 I imagine if you can they'll sell out quite quickly um, so I just thought I'd drop those in there because I thought it was quite interesting. That's me. Thank you, Finn, and uh, apologies that I didn't mention your book in the introduction. This really is a fantastic book. It, Finn launched it about six months ago, and there haven't been any major changes since then, so the information is bang up to date. If you're think If you're thinking of installing solar or adding batteries to an existing system, then it covers all the, the ins and outs, including a lot of the financials. Our next speaker is Jenny Paradiso, who's the Managing Director of Suntrick Solar, and she will be talking about the government's um, home battery scheme, what it involves, and, uh, and the pros and cons. So please welcome Jenny. Hi everyone, it's nice to be back again. I have two slides about myself and Suntrix and then I'm going to be talking to you about the home battery storage scheme. But I always like to start by just letting you know about who we are so that you've got a bit of an understanding about where we've been and I guess to give you some assurance that 99% of the time we know what we're talking about as well. Uh, so Suntrix uh, was established in 2009, in fact, at the same time as Solar Quotes, and we used to, that was how we started our business as well. Um, um, so we kind of started from the same origins with Finn. 
We're 100% South Australian owned, but we do operate nationally and most of our work is in South Australia and Victoria, a little bit in New South Wales as well. So we do a lot of government work and a lot of commercial installations, but we also, we started as a residential solar company and we always do and always will do residential installations. And we're obviously picking up on a lot of the uh, home battery as well. Uh, we were a founding um, member of the Clean Energy Council's uh, Retailers Code of Conduct, which is one of the codes that you need to be a member of to be able to participate in this scheme as a retailer. And um, we've also got a local monitoring system called MyWatts. We put that on every unit that we put out there so that we can, we've got assurance that our systems are working how they're supposed to. A uh, little bit about me, born and bred in South Australia. I've actually come and, and spoken before, so some of people might have already seen that lovely green laminex table, but that's where it all started. Uh, and basically, I'm a librarian by trade and uh, started Suntrix uh, in 2009 with my husband, um, with my three-month-old daughter who's turning 10 in March, so we're really excited about that. I'm actually on the board of the Clean Energy Council, which is our peak body. Uh, which is a national board. I'm on the Premier's Climate Change Council, which is uh, based in South Australia. I'm also on um, a distributed energy leadership forum for the CEC, CEC and also on the SA Power Network's Renewable Reference um, Group. So we meet every two months. I can see Heather here as well. We meet every two months and have a very good relationship with SA Power Networks and provide information to them about what isn't, isn't working from our perspective. Um, and not related to solar, I'm also on the Entrepreneurs Advisory Board for South Australia, which has recently launched. And I'm a big fan of Renew. Actually, I wrote ATA on there to start with. Sorry, and then took it off. Big fan of Renew, always have been. Um, so the HBS, as we like to call it, uh, for the home battery scheme, it was launched in October 2018. It was actually announced a few months before that and then they officially launched it in 2018. It's available for 40,000 homes and they've got about $100 million to spend. Now, it's only for residential homes and they need to be located in South Australia. If you're running a business from that home, um, generally the paperwork says that that's okay, but it does need to be a home, not an actual business premises. Um, you get up to $6,000, which uh, has already been mentioned, and they're also mentioned there's a nine-week priority scheme for um, manufacturers that are assembling or have committed to assemble in South Australia. And this is part of the SA government's larger plan about getting more manufacturing, assembly and jobs in SA. And so just to give you a little bit of breakdown, if you've got, if you're a energy concession holder, so you have to be an energy concession holder and that's showing up on your electricity bill, you can get up to $600 per kilowatt hour, otherwise you get $500. So for example, if you get a 600, uh, sorry, a six kilowatt hour battery, then it's six times $600, so you can get $3,600 back or $3,000 back if you don't have your concession. If you go over, for example, the 13.5 kilowatt hour battery, basically the maximum you can get is $6,000. Okay, and feel free to take photos of these and I can provide them afterwards. All this information is on our website as well if you don't get a chance to get it down now. Who's in the priority scheme? So as I said, there's um, a number of units that are available to be purchased this year and then basically it opens up to everyone else uh, from January. So Sonnen was the first one to come in and they were launched as part of the scheme and Alpha ESS were announced late last week and had their launch today. And we just got an announcement today with Iguana, which is actually an LG Chem, for those who've heard of that product. That's actually also been launched today as well. So we now have three batteries that are available to be purchased through the scheme now, okay? One of the questions that I get a lot is, well, what if, what if it's not available next year? If I, am I gonna run out of time? Should I buy one now? What if there's nothing left at the end of the nine weeks? We haven't got an official answer on that, but every person I've talked to, all of the stakeholders from government and also from um, rate setter are saying that there's still a reasonable, reasonably large amount of money in that pot. So whilst I'm not saying wait 12 months or, <laughs> or even six months, I, I, I personally don't think that the urgency is there to get something signed up by the end of the year if you need a little bit more time to look into it. If it does run out, I didn't say that, okay? <laughs> All right, some important facts. These, again, these are things that are coming through um, from our clients and kind of the key areas that I wanted to raise. This isn't a free battery. 
Uh, there are out-of-pocket expenses anywhere from $6,000 to $10,000, uh, depending on what you buy and what options you're interested in. Um, there were some schemes that were announced by the previous government in regards to VPP, virtual power plant schemes, uh, for, for example, for housing trust homes, which are still going ahead, but this is different. So it's really important to understand that it's not a free battery, there is still out-of-pocket expenses. Um, the scheme is in the money you get back is only available for the battery you purchase, not to install solar or to upgrade your solar. But there are low interest rates available, so the government have partnered with a finance company called Rate Setter, and they can, can, they can actually give you um, low interest rates for your battery and for your solar as well if you choose to take it. Now, you don't need to go through them. So you can still buy the battery and go through another finance partner, add it onto your mortgage or your home loan if you want to, but that is available if you choose to. And, and I, I'm sorry, I don't actually know the exact rates, but they're about 6 7%, I think. Rate set of rates? 5.5. There you go, 5.5. Lovely. Thanks, Eddie. Um, now, batteries must be VPP enabled, which means they must be able to operate as a virtual power plant, but you are not committed to doing that when you go through this scheme. So you can buy your battery and choose not to participate in any future VPP schemes, and any schemes that the government introduces in the future, you will have an option to opt in or opt out. And they're obviously going to make it worth your while to opt in. And this is, we were having a conversation about this and what Finn mentioned before in regards to your payback for your battery. And he made it really clear that that's based on the current rates right now for what you're paying for electricity and what you're getting paid for, for what you feed back into the grid. We're expecting that with a VPP um, uh, initiative coming in from government, they're going to make it worth your while to pay it back in and I'm going to assume that that's going to help you pay off your battery faster. Unfortunately, at this very stage, we don't have any information about what they're planning. The other thing to remember when you're looking at batteries is in most of these systems backup is an option. It's an added extra, so to speak. And so, as Finn mentioned as well, it's really important to identify how important battery, battery backup is to you because there will be an extra cost for that if you choose to have it. And that goes back to your own personal interests. We've installed batteries for someone who doesn't use it um, for their ROI. They really keep it at full charge all the time, just in case there's a backup. And that's their choice to do that, and they know that it will affect their return on investment. There are other people who bring it down at the, um, throughout the day and then, oh, sorry, bring it down and then charge it up during the day and then bring it down again and then do that every day and that's going to give you the, the maximum return. Um, batteries need to be on a CEC approved battery storage list. So that is available on the Clean Energy Council's website. There are actually only about five or six batteries on that list at the very moment, but there are more coming on each day. Well, not each day, each week, okay? But you can go in and see what ones are on there at the moment. And companies also need to be uh, on an approved retailer's list. Now, this list has actually been around since 2014. It's been slowly increasing in interest. And, and what happens with that, with the code, is that for a company to be able to, to sign up to that code, they need to go through quite a rigorous um, inspection and criteria to be able to get on there. So when we were actually part of the founding partners because we saw this as something that we thought would be very good for the industry. Unfortunately, as you're all aware, there are a lot of cowboys in the industry as well and we wanted to give people, it's kind of like the heart tick, okay? Someone's checked these. It's not just me telling you that we're a good company. Someone else has gone in. Obviously, it's not perfect, but what they did was they went through our terms and conditions. They had a look at how we deal with after customer service. They had a look at how we handled our warranties. They checked that our financials weren't in such a horrible state that we were about to go out of business and they had a look at all of those checks and then before we could actually get onto the code. Because we've been on it for quite a while, we've actually been audited on there as well. So we had someone come to our, come to our workplace and check all of those processes and systems and warranties and number of, even right down to the fact of how many number of, number of service calls we get and how quickly it takes us to reply to them. So whilst I'm involved in the scheme, I, I, and so I'm, I have a bit of a bias, I also think that it's uh, quite a good indicator of some of the better companies that are out there. 
Um, now, you need to be on the code or you need to have signed an agreement that you commit to being on the code. And that's because to be able to get on the code, it can take eight weeks because they are very, they do a lot of due diligence. And the government didn't want to um, stop companies who were interested in participating in the scheme because it was going to take them a while to get on there. So they need to agree to that. Now, the Clean Energy Council's uh, retailer code, they reject about 50% of the companies who actually apply for that code, okay? Because they are, they, they set the bar very high. The companies can go back and reapply for it and it's not an issue. It's just something to keep in mind in regards to please do your own due diligence anyway, um, regardless of whether they've said they're signing up, okay? If you're interested in the subsidy, this is a really general flow on what would happen. So your first step is to find a company who can help you identify a battery that's gonna suit your particular need. The Home Battery Storage website lists all of the companies who have been approved, okay? So go there first. Obviously, both of us are on there. Um, that solar company enters your job on the HBS website and they give you a quote number. This is basically once you've decided on what you want and you, you're happy to go ahead. And then you go to that website, you click on apply for subsidy button and you enter your quote number. At the end of it, once the system is installed, you basically pay the, pay the solar company the amount less the subsidy, okay? And then it's our job to go through the scheme and get the rest of that money back, kind of like what you do with um, small technology certificates at the moment. So you don't need to follow that part up with the government, you just pay the lesser amount. And that's it. I'm sure there'll be other questions later on. Thanks, Jenny. Um, just one thing, you mentioned backup and Finn talked about uh, um, what happens during a blackout. Could one of you during the Q&A session just explain what hardware is required so that adding batteries also gives you um, security during a power blackout because adding the batteries to an existing PV system doesn't automatically cover you if there's a street blackout, but it, perhaps if you could just... Yeah, okay, if, could, could you just cover that during the Q&A session? And we'll now go on to the, the third possession third presenter from NRG Systems who will be talking about what sort of batteries are currently available and the, the pros and cons of them. Please welcome Eddie May. Thanks very much. Uh, yeah, so uh, welcome and thank you. Um, I haven't spoken to you guys before, so uh, I was quite pleased when Alan contacted me and uh, enabled me to get this chance, so thank you for having me. Now, which one have we got here? All right, I'll be really quick on this, but um, uh, for those who don't know the NRG story, we started in 2014, so that's when I founded the business. And so I don't have the years of experience, or the combined 20 years of experience as the guy standing next to me. So, um, but I was really passionate about understanding what the future of energy would be in our state, and I could see the transition looming. So. When I started the business, we focused only as a service and maintenance company, actually, and we fixed a thousand solar systems before we decided to install a new system or install a commercial or a residential system. And that gave us an incredible amount of data and myself personally, an incredible amount of knowledge, um, learning from other mistakes. And I think, you know, just, just what, assuming, making some assumptions of who's in the room here, I can imagine there's some very old systems that were bought some time ago and the majority of you guys probably had the benefit um, of getting someone on board um, and installing a really high quality system because that's how it was really at the start. You know, there were really passionate people installing high quality systems. But then we had this flood of cowboys come into the market and uh, uh, make a little bit of a, a mess of it. And a lot of those have gone now, um, fortunately, and I think you know, things like, as Jenny said, the um, CEC retailer program and various things like that have helped to sort of sort them all out. But there was a time when a lot of that was going out. So, so we got to repair all those systems and, and, uh, and, and fix them or replace them. And, and as a result of that, we learned. And 
Our brand promise internally between us and to our staff uh, and to our customers are to do it once and give peace of mind and to be safe. And I think it's this last part, I think, that uh, is more important now to think about um, with uh, us putting battery storage in our homes. Um, it, it's really quite important. Um, so I'll just touch on chemistries now. I've got a feeling that there's probably a, quite a few people in the room that know a lot more about this subject than I do. So if you do, feel free to um, say whatever you want because I probably won't dispute you. But the point of this um, slide is, and I wasn't necessarily going to talk about all the chemistries, but what I was just going to point out is it's the role, I think, of um, somebody who's selling these systems to understand what it is that the customer actually wants to get out of their system. So really, the first question really should be, what are you, what, what you going to do with this battery? What do, you, what, what do you want to use it for? And if it's purely for blackout or if it's for cycling, how quickly you want to cycle it and so forth. And I think it's the role of the business that's selling these to understand that different chemistries are designed for different things and, uh, and, and that's important. So I've just got a quick example here of uh, um, comparing um, a battery that's, say, in a Sonnen versus a battery that's in a Tesla. And um, if we just, if I, both those uh, batteries, uh, we, I sell, right? So, uh, and I think they're cr both great and they both got unique features about each other. And if I just, to summarise it, just for the, for the, I guess the average person that doesn't know a lot about it, the Tesla one is the one at the bottom and with the Tesla, if, you know, they're really designed for their cars, right? So if you want to go up Wollonga Hill, you want to put your foot down, you want to get, get there, you'll get there bloody quick with the Tesla. I think we all know that. Um, you might not get there as quick with a Sonnen. And that's probably a way to think about the different chemi That's because of the way that the chemistry is built and the way that Sonnen treats that, uh, that piece of chemistry. But what you've got, if you look at the, di the two sort of spiderweb diagrams, you've got the Tesla showing, you know, great energy um, and uh, uh, you've got the Sonnen showing terrific safety, right, and a longer lifespan. So it's just understanding this when we're talking to a customer and our customers, we, we, you know, we really need to understand what are you using this for? Because I can tell you the Tesla will take you up Wollonga Hill a, a whole lot quicker than the Sonnen but the Sonnen will take you there for so many more trips than what the Tesla will, right? And I think, you know, so you've got to decide, are you in it for the, do you want the speed or do you want the, do you want the length of duration? So that's just an example. Um, now, does anyone need me to talk about the difference between AC coupled and DC coupled um, systems? Are you, all guy, are you all on top of that? Yeah, you're on top of it. Yeah, I think you would be. Yeah, okay. So um, I'll skip over. I'll skip over that one. Um, but some of the th this is some of the things that we talk about when we talk to customers, and I think it's really just understanding again what does the customer actually want to do with this. And you know, there's what we're finding is that the general public um, don't get a chance to even understand the difference between an AC coupled and a DC coupled system, um, and and in effect. I guess um, what we're finding is, is that you know, these cowboys are, you know, could potentially come into this market next year, and this is something that I'm fearful of, and start talking about things that are, I guess, DC coupled systems that are designed purely to be that, but being installed as an AC coupled system and then having problems as a result and not having the results to the customer. So um, I think, again, it's something to think about when we're comparing the different batteries. Um, and I guess my general view on it, because I like a DC coupled system, I think they're more efficient. If you've already got an adequate size solar system, we're more than happy to put on an AC coupled system because I think um, it, it's simple, it's easy for you and it makes sense um, and it and it's can, can often be cheaper. Um, if you need more solar or you need to start from scratch, you know, have a look at a hybrid inverter. Um, it's going to be more efficient for you in the long run. So that's one of the things that we, that we say. So we were talking about the different types of batteries that are around and I guess the other part was just trying to get an understanding out of, um, you know, depth of discharge, cycles, warranties, and then whether the VPP actually affects warranties. Because documents from last, you know, warranty documents from last year um, 
particularly around this state, had a lot of batteries that if you read their warranty document deeply enough, if you used it in a VPP, it would void their standard unlimited or 10,000 cycle warranty and you'd revert back to a throughput warranty. Um, and uh, we're starting to see those things change. I haven't seen it change with Teslas yet. Have you heard of that? So I haven't seen Teslas change, but um, if you use a Tesla, as I understand, in a, in a non-normal cycling arrangement, um, the, the warranty drops back to 3,700 and not 10,000. But the reason for this slide actually isn't necessarily to show you all the differences. It's to remind me to talk about how unrealistic it is to do 10,000 cycles in, in 10 years, and it really wouldn't matter. I'm pretty sure someone's gonna roll in with a cowboy hat on next year and offer you 25,000 cycles in seven years or something like that. But the, to Finn's point, you know, if you charge and if you fully discharge this every day, that's going to be 3,650 cycles. And if you did it one and a half times, what's that math going to equal? It's like five or six or something. And the likelihood is you're not likely to get to 10. All right. Not in 10 years, not in the warranty period. So really, once cycles get up over 6,000 in a 10 years, they, they really become irrelevant to the conversation. Unless the battery manufacturer really believes that they've designed it with those cycles in mind. And, you know, when I speak to the guys from Germany, Sonnen, you know, they look at the Australian warranty as a consumer law thing, but they actually do believe that they've designed this to last for 10,000 cycles. Uh, but they've also got their consumer law to deal with the, the way that they put that into their warranty. So if you, you know, sometimes you need to look past the warranty period to calculate your return on investment um, because quite possibly it will last past its warranty period. And, and I suspect when you see something like designed for 20 years of life, uh, like, on, like on a lot of um, Sonnen's documentation out of Germany, I don't think they're not changing their design for Australia, it's just our consumer law. So it's just something to consider. Um, now there's a bit of talk about um, choosing the right battery and I think considering the future is important and I know that um, Jenny and, and Finn, uh, well Finn doesn't have a crystal ball and I, I have a little bit of a crystal ball because um, I do sit on the SAPN uh, now in the distributed energy reference group they just changed the last name of that so I just made sure I got it right but basically it is around their 2020 to 2025 draft plan that they've just released to the public they've now pulled it back they've got all the consultation they need and they're preparing it for submission um, but, you know, just pulling out of it, so this was public, I haven't been able to give you anything on the sneaky, yet, really, this has just come off their website, but um, if you look at this, there's a couple of things that we've pulled out. The first thing, it's very clear that, um, you know, they want to have a no regrets investment of $37 million initially into what they consider battery storage and VPP, so that where they can enable some investment in that area. So, you know, virtual power plants, you know, the network, the government are backing them, uh, the, the, they're backing them with the grants, the network is gonna be ready for them, which means virtual power plant providers will come in and they will come in with some smashing deals for people that have got a battery, um, a virtual power plant enabled battery. So you're gonna see retailers come in and be offering some, you know, I've already seen some offers come out already, Energy Australia has one right now. Um, which is a cracker of an offer that you, if you've got a v, a, an enabled battery, um, you, can, you can jump straight on a VPP, uh, deal with them straight away. So, so that's something to think about because you're not going to get that in your return on investment calculation, right? So you're going to get that if you've got a battery. Um, the second section of this is the, um, um, you know, there's significant conversations in this group around um, proposed time of use. Uh, and so initially, the, the thoughts are that they will be offering voluntary 
proposed time of use, all right, which means you'll be able to voluntarily enter potentially into time of use. But time of use is coming. There's, this, there's absolutely no way at some point in 10 years' time that I'll stand here and we will not have time of use available because we've got such a high penetration of renewables in this state. We just, they don't want our solar during between 11 a.m. and 2 p.m. Who wants that anyway, all right? So, therefore, the tariffs will go, time of use will come in, and that will change the habits of the, because that's what forces habit change, right? Demand charges for commercial has forced a lot of change in the commercial sector, and that's, that's helped stabilise the grid. This is what will happen as well. So it's another thing to, I guess, consider with your choices. So we're happy to answer questions on perhaps uh, more specifics around the different battery technologies and stuff like that as you, as you ask them. Um, but, you know, from my view, you know, we're in this, uh, we're in this together, which means that, uh, you know, we're all playing a different play, a part in this race, you know, Finn plays a different place than I do and you guys all play a part as well. So I thank you for that and, uh, you know, we're, we're here to help you and answer your questions if we can. Thank you. Thanks, Eddie. Um, okay, we'll come now to the question and answer session. I'll ask you to please keep, get straight onto a question and uh, many years in the Alternative Technology Association, I've noticed that people will like to proceed a simple question with a life history. So if you can just keep it uh, straight to a question and give an idea of who it may be directed at. The questions will be taken from this microphone and camera there. If you don't wish to be videoed, could you write your question down and give it to Catherine and she will hand it in at the, at the front. So, pretty well, if anyone with a question, if they'd like to start making their way up here. I'm sorry? Yes, yeah, uh, oh, what I should have started off saying is Finn needs to go at 25 past eight, so if I can just uh, pass over to him, and if you have any questions specifically for him, such as where do I buy your book, how do I get it signed, um, do do that before he before he goes. Thanks, Finn. Uh, very quickly, if you're buying a battery, tell them that you want backup because not all batteries come with backup. And more specifically, there are two types of backup. There's what I call regular backup, and then there's what I call apocalypse-proof backup. Regular backup: if the grid goes down, the battery will drain, and then you've got no energy left. Apocalypse-proof backup, the grid goes down, the battery can still get charged from the solar panels. So as long as the sun's up, you can charge your battery, and as long as you're careful with your energy use, you can, in theory, go on forever, okay? Until till something dies. So, and the reason there's two different types of backup is because the second is a lot harder to achieve and needs clever electronics. So specify if you want backup, specify if you want your batteries to charge from the solar panels without the grid, because a lot of batteries don't do that. Um, look, there is an expiry date. I know that there, uh, and I, I've, we um, asked some specific questions, but we haven't had specific answers yet. Um, do you, you haven't heard anything different? I've been told about three months, so from when you um, put in your yes, I've bought this system to when it needs to be installed uh, is about three months. That's the general terms we've been given. Um, I talked to someone today who's involved in the scheme and said, so we've got a lot of people who are concerned that you're going to run out of money. And he said, look, it is going to happen eventually or they might actually reduce the amount that's available in the scheme. But he said, we've got a big pot of money and we've hardly hit the first pot yet. 
So there's still a little bit of time to go. Uh, I guess I have a, a double barrel question, um, relating mainly to what Finn was saying in regards to 44 cent rebates. Uh, have SA Power Networks cancelled out the contract that existed for those who had the 44 cent rebate, would lose that rebate immediately if they changed the inner capacity of their solar power system? Or is that still in existence? And the other point is that obviously people like that have the older style inverters. Uh, we talk about buying a battery, plugging it into your, in, into your system. A lot of the newer systems have inverters integrated with the battery cabinet, but a lot of people here would have the older inverters, freestanding inverters, and some may be under the, under the misapprehension that you can just go and plug a battery system into your existing grid connect inverter, which of course you cannot do. Um, I get around it by having two inverters. I've got a grid inverter and a sine wave inverter, and so when my blackouts occur, my sine wave inverter automatically cuts in and gets me back up power. So double question on that. SO Power Networks. The rules haven't changed about 44 cent feed-in tariff. It's still really easy to lose it. You get a battery, you, change your system, you increase your system, you'll lose it. Um, with AC coupling that Eddie was talking about, you can connect a battery to any grid connect solar system that's ever been installed in Australia using AC coupling, because it goes in on the 240 volts. DC coupling, totally different matter. So even if you've got a really old inverter, you will be able to connect a battery with AC coupling. Can I just, um, can I just add to that? And we talked to a lot of people about with the, oh, we just call it the old fit, but the 44 cent fit as well. <laughs> do you, yeah, there you go. Um, one of the things that we do talk to people about, and Finn referenced this as well, is that we've got a lot of people who are on the old fit with one and a half kilowatt systems, and they're not feeding anything in anyway, or very, very, very little. So it's important to actually have a look at how much you're feeding in over a year, um, because if it's not a much, you might actually be better off losing that feed-in tariff, getting a bigger solar system, and a battery, or not even a battery. Um, but it's definitely worth doing those numbers. Thank you, and thanks for coming down. Um, yeah, I'm one of those old people on the 1.5 system that's 10, nearly eight years old. It's paid for itself. No life story, though. The question I thought was going to be, um, I know I thought my previous uh, question maker took the question, was about inverters. I think the research suggests that with a solar system, the, the dodgiest part, or the one that has the most problems, is the inverter. Um, and I just wondered, from your perspective, now we're going to have systems which have panels, inverters, and batteries. Will batteries be as problematic? Just a, a very general question. Do you think, um, do you accept the fact that what I said was that the inverter is generally the, the thing that gives the most problem? How will batteries be like? Uh, yeah, that's a, that's a good question. My view on that is that um, the, the reliability of the battery will be very much determined by the quality of the, of the battery inverter um, because if you've, you've got good chemistry and a good, so, you know, a lot of these battery manufacturers, what we're finding is um, there's less amount of bat battery manufacturers out there than the labels that you see on the boxes. In other words, you know, typically, for example, you know, the Sony um, battery, you know, you'll see them in a Fronius inverter, you'll see them in a Sonnen inverter, as an example, and so forth, right? So I think the quality of the batteries um, aren't as much of what's at risk as the quality of the battery inverter that's in there. And I think that's where we might start to see the potential for some problems. Um, and also the optimistic view of some that you can treat a battery as harshly as you like and it'll, it'll be fine as well. I think we'll also see um, some issues around that. So yeah, quite possibly. But um, the one thing that is interesting is that what we're starting to see is different warranties around batteries as we are around the battery inverter that's in the same case as the battery. And I do find that a little bit interesting if you've got a battery inverter, uh, an all-in-one system supposedly, but the inverter's got a three-year or a five-year warranty and the battery straight underneath it's got 10, um, you know, that might be a bit of a signal to your question. Thank you. My, my question is a bit of, on a different tack, and I, there may be other people in the audience here like me. I don't want any subsidies. I just want to buy a battery. Because if I go away for four weeks on holidays, I don't want the electrical distribution companies running my batteries every day up and down and using up the cycles. I just want to buy batteries, and I'd love to see a table somewhere, say a 10 kilowatt uh, size batteries from different manufacturers so I can make a comparison. 
I've had huge difficulty trying to get that. They all want to sell me a system with subsidies, every one of them. Um, so with the virtual power plant, they cannot do that without your agreement. So you can take advantage of the subsidy and just use it for yourself. Yeah, no, I don't even want to be part of it. Okay. I can't get batteries full stop. Sure. Okay. Um, we've got a graph on our website that um, lists three different batteries that we provide and it tells you what your recommended size of your solar system would be for each battery, um, minimum size of your solar system and then kind of the highlights of what we think is really important. So go on there and have a look and see whether that answers your questions and then just buy it without the subsidy if you choose to, that's yeah. still an option. Yeah, I'll give you a ring. Uh, and what we do is we've got a little calculator so we get your electricity bills and we we're having this conversation behind as well. We get your electricity bill and we have a look at what you're currently paying for electricity and um, if you've got a solar system, what you're currently getting paid for feeding it back in. I apologise, my fault. I didn't want any of that. I just want to buy a battery. I don't want to show anyone my bill. I just want to buy a battery. Sure. That's the the reason we do that... Well, hey, <laughs> um, OK, Anosh is here and Catherine's out the back. Go talk to one of them. We'll sell your battery, no problem. <laughs> But we, but we do try and give you an idea on your return on investment. That's, that's kind of what I was trying to indicate. Because even with the subsidy, there are some people that we talk to and on the current rates, your current tariffs and your current, your current feed-in tariffs and currently what you're buying, sometimes your return on investment is still over 10 years. And that's kind of the general life, lifespan of a battery. Now, that's as of right now. If you join the VPP scheme, it's probably going to be more attractive. If electricity rates go up or down or your tariffs go up or down, it will change as well. But at least we give you a general idea. And then there are other people, again, the backup is, for some people, having backup ability is more important to them than ROI, return on investment. So it depends on what your personal drivers are. Well, thank you. You have kind of answered one of my questions. <laughs> but um, I, I feel totally ignorant about all of these issues. And for my sins, I have two sisters who, when they heard I was coming, said, please take notes so that you can tell us what, th what we should do. Um, and I've taken notes. I don't know that I can tell them what they should do. But because you're here, I trust it's not unjustified that I feel that I can trust these people. So if I were to get onto the website, your website, and say, please, can you come out or can you send somebody out to my place and to my sister's place so that we can actually sit there talking in person? Could you do that? Would okay, you do I'll that? do one, you do one, how's that? Yeah? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll take you or your sister either way. Like, we'll do one each. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, any good company worth their salt will go through all the details with you, will inspect your home, make sure that they know. And that's the other thing about batteries. Some of them need to be installed indoors. They have an IP rating. Um, some of them can only be installed outdoors if they're under a veranda or they've got a special enclosure. So people need to have a look at your specific home, your requirements as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I, we are definitely both very nice people and trustworthy. Well, I'm talking for myself here. I'm not, sh I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, well. <laughs> I'm not sure about Eddie actually, but you know. <laughs> But, yeah, you yeah, know, any, yeah. anyone would be able to help you with that. Who, right. any, anyone who's willing to go out to your home should be able to explain it all to you. Okay, yeah. My problem is that I tend to be a very trusting person. And so if, if anybody comes, I'll trust what they, what they say. But, of course, if you come out to our place at Kalut, um, yeah, we'll give you morning tea and a beautiful view and so forth. <laughs> so I might be in Well, touch. in that case, I'm definitely going to yours. And my installers love it as well. We rang one of our installers the other day and he said, oh, uh, just hold on a second, I'm just having a cup of tea with the owner. <laughs> and it's like, you're supposed to be on the roof. <laughs> so we would definitely like to come Good visit day. you. Thanks very much. Thanks. And make sure you get a couple of quotes. But, but it's not just about price. I mean, price is really important. But the... the um, the quality of the company, how they install systems, how they provide support, customer support, are they local, how big or small are they? Sometimes the really big ones are 
um, difficult because you're not a real person to them. You want a company that's big enough that they've got the resources in-house to provide the support you need, but small enough that they still know who you are. You're a person, not a name or a number to them. And so that's really important when you're having a look at um, who to go with, not just these guys are $300 cheaper. Okay. Oh, hi, good evening all. It's a question I think about renewable energy certificates. Uh, currently, just look at the advertisers of the mail, there's quite a few companies now, uh, when we're limited by five kilowatt uh, panels, uh, sorry, five kilowatt feed in into the South Australia, South Australia Power Networks grid, m many companies are advertising six and more than six kilowatt panels. Now, therefore, are we receiving renewable energy certificates on the limit of five kilowatts or on this six and a half or seven or eight kilowatts? Yeah, you're receiving it on the, on the peak power on of the, the panel, so you'd be receiving it on 6.6 .6 in that case. Okay, even though you're only allowed to export five kilowatts into the network by SAPAN Networks regulations from the 1st of November that, that, 2017. That, that is, that is, that is correct. If you yeah. um, single phase or, you know, on a swear a line is, or something like yeah. that, then you are limited to, but you'll still con you can still self-consume the balance, right? So yeah. your 6.6 .6 kilowatt system oh, okay. can be doing, right. can yeah. be doing six yeah. and you're consuming yeah. one and yeah. exporting five. So you're still a power generator as far as the okay. STCs are and concerned. And that means the inverter must limit itself to five kilowatts feeding into the network. That's right. Yep, right. But you could have a six kilowatt yep. inverter, hypothetically, um, and you just need to limit the export to five. Yep. Correct. And the other thing is more of a question, or perhaps as a statement, and that is that uh, many people who got solar systems installed at about the period of transition from when SA Power Networks did the meter installation to now when the energy supplier does, a, does, does now the meter installation, Many of those people were excluded from the conversation so that you had SA Power Networks and the, uh, the, whole, the, the retailer and some electrician were supposed to turn up at the same day to install the new meters and it's like trying to corral scalded cats. And I know at least one person, because I work for them, they had to wait more than six months to have their new reversible meters installed so they could benefit from the, the new solar panels and every week phone calls are made and they're just excluded from the conversation and SA Power Networks will tell you oh we've got a 140 page manual just go from to that but you go to that manual and every page has got printed on it do not rely on this manual <laughs> there's really there's nowhere it's cash 22 there's nowhere that every citizens can get proper advice on these solar panels, except perhaps for yourselves. But the authorities have just left people for dead. So there's big problems there and they're still occurring. So thank you very much for listening. No worries. Yeah, you can. Just to, just to give you some more de detail about the metres. So December, December last year, there was, it was December, wasn't it? Yeah, thanks. <laughs> Um, they put in a consumer choice in regards... So before that, SA Power Networks provided all the metres for South Australia. Uh, and then they put in consumer choice and they handed that over to the retailer instead. And the theory was that consumer choice and competitive behaviour would mean that the retailers would try really hard to provide a good value um, product and install it very quickly. And it didn't happen. And so there were people who were waiting months and months and months to get their meter installed. And this, I mean, this affected, well, this is one of the hardest things for us because the solar company always gets the blame for it. It's always our fault that they can't turn their system on because they don't have a meter, um, even when we're waiting for a retailer to actually go and do their bit. Um, and so, it, but it doesn't just affect the solar um, industry as well. It's like people who build a home and are waiting for a meter as well. Um, it, it got escalated quite a lot and then a couple of months ago uh, the minister, energy minister got involved as well and they did set up um, some penalties and there were three retailers in South Australia who signed up to this agreement. It was Simply Energy, AGL, 
I can't remember the third, I don't know whether it was Origin or it was one of the other big ones. And they actually signed up to this agreement that you, they needed to install the meter within 30 days. All the other retailers haven't. Um, but all I can say is if, you're, if it's taking a long time after you get your solar installed to get your new import-export meter, definitely talk to your solar company first and make sure they've done the right thing. Um, but a lot of the time they have, and then follow it up with the retailer and go to the ombudsman if you need to. Now this for these into the solar the solar panel producers. They were yeah. long from the scene. Yeah. It was. Yeah. The this, this, this was your particular case. With okay. okay. But this is a general thing too, and that is that most people have the old Dobby Dicko meters, which will, would read in reverse as well, and they refused to take those readings because they wanted to sell you the new digital meters. Thank you. I'm just getting my head around all of this. I'm pretty new to it also. Not sure if this is a silly question or not, but um, we're also building a house middle of next year and um, we're in that early stage now of, of working out floor plans and designs and I'm just curious to know, is there a simple answer to the question of should I be designing anything for a, a, a future battery now? Yeah, you should. Um, I think it's worthwhile you talking to... One thing that you can do is you can find a provider or supplier that you're happy with. So you can come to, you can go to Suntrix or you can come to NRG or one of the other suppliers that you're happy with. Just uh, <laughs> we've got a showroom on South Road. You can come and look at batteries and you can work out. Jenny mentioned before that um, about enclosures as an example. So the IP rating, she was talking about IP rating. So that some batteries um, ca can't go outside as an example. So they need to be in quite a um, secure, um, clean environment in your home. Other batteries can be located outside. Sometimes they need enclosures. And to my point before, you know, when you when you talk with someone, they they will talk with you about your battery needs. That'll lead to a battery choice. That might lead to how you're going to house the battery. It would be worthwhile you having the conversation when you're in the early stages of building, even if you decide on. Um, a model that gets superseded by another model, that's, that's okay as well. But what you don't want to be doing is you don't want to be building onto your home something that, uh, that, that you didn't plan for. And at the same time, you know, you can sign up to a solar system and we can get your, you know, SEG approvals done. Um, you know, the products might change uh, and I do understand that and you should just make sure that you're with a provider. We, were, we change products all the time for people that are building. We say, hey, I know that um, you originally ordered X but Y is here now and it's the next model up um, and that's uh, currently what we're recommending and we're going to switch you to it and um, there's no change in cost or if there is it's an option that you can have a look at so I think I think if you're building it is definitely worth um, getting your head around what what sort of thing that you want because everyone says oh there's new technology coming it really doesn't change that quickly not in the course of a build and if it does it's generally a model variation or a capacity variation not that one's totally in the bin and there's some whole brand new different thing out. Um, Matt? Um, we've actually helped people design storage rooms for their batteries within their house and actually incorporate it as part of the house because you've also got to be very careful about if you want to install a battery inside, it cannot be in a livable area. And so, um, the, you know, the building code, it tells you what a livable area is. Laundries are questionable. We don't generally do laundries. Garages are okay. But if, you've, if you're creating it, you know, we can make sure that you've got the right size room with the right ventilation and everything else. And also, as Eddie said, you can get your uh, sedge done so you get the right metre straight away. Um, not so much of an issue anymore. And also, uh, depending on what your builder is like, Ideally, we want to come and do a first fix for you. So before the roof goes on, when the walls are up, let us come and run the panels in the cavity so it's nice and clean and beautiful. You don't have to deal with it afterwards. Some builders will let us on site for that. Some won't. It just depends on who you use. Actually, just one, you just remind me of one other thing. Some builders as well, or actually the roof trust manufacturers will put a yellow sticker in your manhole cover saying no additional loads um, permitted on this roof without our prior consent. So that's another reason in the planning stages if you decided for a 6.6 .6, um, kilowatt system, hypothetically, that might be 20 panels, that might take up whatever, 30 odd square metres. You know, we can provide you that detail that you can give it to, you can incorporate as part of your bargaining, hey, by the way, I also want you to make sure that you've allowed the roof trusses to be able to cope with my solar or future solar. That'll be one less thing for you to muck around with, you know, when you take your keys. 
Thanks so much for the discussion. Um, we, we have an old, very old solar system, one of the original ones, um, and that serves our purposes for now. I guess the step change that I'm waiting for is for electric vehicles. Um, so I'm just wondering whether, you know, how we in start thinking about the integration of electric vehicles into the batteries and the solar systems. Electric vehicles are a portable battery. It's awesome. Yes, <laughs> so wheels. you can you can um, drive it to work, charge it up at work, take it home, power your house at night time. It's going to be fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> Unless you work at Suntrix, but well, that's okay if you work at Suntrix. But, but, um, but it's I guess going to in reverse where you can't charge it during the day and you have to. Yeah, so you know sit, your batteries at home sitting, waiting. <laughs> To yeah. charge in a day and then your vehicles. Yeah, it's uh, going so. to change use again, energy use again. So we used to have, um, you know, you have a look at how people use energy over the day and the night, and you have a look at 10 years ago before solar had really boomed, and it's completely different to now. And I think electric vehicles are going to, and storage in general, are going to change that again. Um, and SA Power Networks and the tariffs are all going to start reflecting that as well. They're already looking at it. So I don't actually have an answer for it, but it's definitely going to be um, changing that space. One thing I will add um, in relation to electrical, electric vehicles is um, people quite often think about the amount of capacity that's on the you know, brochure of your electric vehicle. Oh, it takes 50 kilowatt hours. But, you, but very, very rarely do you charge 50 kilowatt hours in a day, right? You're just generally topping up what you just used on the way to work and back. So, um, you know, while it will change um, the landscape um, a little bit, um, some modelling that I've seen at F SA Power Network is that they, the overall scheme isn't as big as 50 kilowatt hours times by every single household um, because of, you know, those reasons. And I actually think we're going to see this really big uptake of uh, um, companies that have solar systems being able to, you know, as a bit of an added benefit. Because a lot of these commercial solar systems being built still export to the grid during the day. Um, and that would be just great incentive for companies in the future to say, hey, by the way, when you come to work, park there and, um, you know, our system will throw some charge into your car um, if we've got surplus solar and it'll be free for you. So I think that'll be another thing. Yeah. So, so will, you know, are the power networks looking at cars or vehicles as part of the VPPs? That's a great question. <laughs> I, 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 think, I, think, um, I think they're separate. What will happen is VPPs will come where the opportunities will be, so maybe not as part of it, but if you've got a 50 kilowatt hour car battery sitting there that you can discharge and it's all compliant with SA Power Network, the VPUP will come looking for you. They'll find you, don't worry. Thank you. Can I contribute to that, actually? Because in the UK, um, and we are copying the UK, there's just been an open networks consultation by the, at the national level, looking at how do we control and, and uh, coordinate all these, orchestrate all these different distributed energy resources. And the thing that's scaring the dis distribution companies in the UK is electric vehicles. So apparently they've already blown up a transformer in a car park in London somewhere. Um, they know that if everyone charges their electric vehicles at the same time, they've got challenges on the grid and they need control for it. So that was a segue to one of my questions. But my first little question is, um, does the uh, rebate count for off-grid systems? No. OK, moving straight <laughs> on to my second question. Um, look, the rebate is there um, to enable virtual power plants to come into our state. And it's a bit of a, if we build it, they'll come, and they will come, and um, we're building it. So, but they obviously can't participate with an off-grid. OK, so my second question is about the controls and how, wh what are you seeing being developed by the battery manufacturers about how their battery will be controlled and um, how smart are they getting to integrate it with other things in your house or your tariffs or, you know, that because in future we imagine this um, could be quite different what we might want and the, and the price signals we might get 
um, to behave in certain ways with our systems? Yeah, that's a good question. Some of the things that's been coming up at the SAPN groups that I've been involved in is a clear understanding from them that they have to be fairly open-minded about how they um, enable controls and how they collect data. So one thing that they don't have a great deal of data on is exactly what all of your individual houses are doing with their solar. They know what's going on at substation level, they even know what's going on at some of the transformer station levels, but they don't know what your house is doing. So what they would like to do is understand what your house is doing so they can participate with your house. So collecting that data is the first thing. So really the, the, the VPP enabled part of this scheme at this point in time is that it's got to be connected to the internet um, and it's got to have a, uh, a network um, capability. And from that point on, um, what they're doing is they're leaving it up to the manufacturers of these systems to work with VPP providers to be able to enable communication. So, um, for, for example, you know, um, Sonnen in Germany um, can already, ca you know, already can control people's batteries to dis automatically charge or automatically discharge using their uh, internet connection. Redback do it um, on a trial that they've got. Um, you know, they've got, we've got a lot of, I mean, you all would have heard about Reposit, um, perhaps. You know, they've um, been involved in enabling VPPs for some time now. Um, so it'll, I think they're leaving it up to the battery manufacturer to, to work out because that's an important selling tool. So are these systems all sitting over the top of the battery inverters and the battery manufacturers are providing something very basic or, or no, no, the battery, man battery manufacturers dishing up fancy Ooh, ours does it this way and theirs does it that way. What do we need to know when we go and buy a battery? Well, I think you need to uh, know that it's VPP enabled. That's really the term and the state government are determining that through their process of approval. So if it's on the battery scheme list, it's been deemed to be VPP enabled. All right, so um, whether that device is a third party device that's been put into the, I think that's what we're gonna start to see. We're not seeing any of that right now. That's what we'll start to see, I think, in the new year. We might see, um, you know, a, I don't know, a solar edge inverter with an LG Chem battery and a Reposit, um, as an example, might be the device that controls it. If that's the package that's been approved, that will be considered VPP enabled. So you won't have to hunt around and wonder to yourself, is this actually going to work in a VPP? It'll have been done for you by state government. Sure. Just to add quickly to that as well, the battery management system, they are all different. And yes, it may be something that you add on as well. There's easy, even... Um, there's some great technology that's coming through with the battery management system for the battery as well. So there are a couple of products that have um, weather forecasting. So they can tell if there's going to be a storm coming up and they will keep your battery charged just in case you lose your power during that storm. So there's some real smarts going in. And the next step is going to know that on Tuesday afternoon, you always come home and you do your washing. You know, like there's, there's stuff coming in in regards to that kind of technology, internet of things that, um, so watch this space. I think it's gonna get really clever. Could I just ask the audience, who here doesn't have solar? Um, and do you have any questions about things um, a bit more before you start adding batteries. A lot of esoteric talks about the technicalities of batteries, but if you're simply considering solar in the first place and you have any questions, come up and, and ask them. Despite what my wife says to me, there really aren't any silly questions. <laughs> um, but just a bit, bit of a, a Dorothy Dixer, when you get someone in to inspect your ho home for solar, should they get up on the roof or should they be able to do it all from Google Maps? Uh, that's a good question. Um, so I think what, um, I don't know exactly what Suntrix do, but I'll talk for NRG. My guys, well, my design consultants don't always get up on your roof if they deem, but they have some criteria that's um, where it is deemed a requirement to get on the roof. And if that is the case, um, we generally will um, scope your job prior to it being installed with someone that does. So, um, you know, for example, um, uh, you know, if it, it, 
oh, I don't know, rate ceilings as an example, right? They might be tricky to work with. We might, we might not be able to see everything. We know you've got rate ceilings, but if they're, ex um, if they're not exposed, I mean, if they're covered up, we can't see the rafter spans. The only way we can tell that is by being up on your roof to know. So that's the sort of time that we would actually, I would send one of my installers out to your home beforehand. Um, but we, we found it, I guess, impractical to get up on the roof every single time because we're still quoting solar at night quite a lot of the time um, and being up on your roof probably doesn't even add a lot of value when it's uh, uh, night time when you're home wanting the solar consultant to come out. So, but I think one thing that you've let is a good point. Buying solar from somebody over the phone um, is not a very successful way to buy solar in my view. And um, it's certainly of the thousand systems that we fixed, it was a common denominator that the installer um, was arriving at the house, was the very first person to see anything to do with the house. Um, and they had the panels already loaded in their trailer. And that led to, um, what, in my view, it probably led to frustration. It probably led to a rush job. It probably led, led to not enough time being allowed and then it led to a poor installation which led to problems. So, um, you know, it, you've reminded me of a tip there. You know, if, you, if you're requesting someone to come out to your home to do an inspection and they don't want to, just go find someone who will. Um, yes, I'm just going through the, the process now of getting a couple of quotes for um, solar and a battery. We're just looking into it. Um, the, my residence is a t quite a reasonable size two-storey um, res residence. We've got pretty large um, reverse cycle ducted um, un air conditioning unit. I spoke to two people. One said it's probably best not to maybe have that running off a battery and someone else has told me the opposite. I was just wondering, is that something um, that you would you can run off a battery? Generally not. Um, so, I mean, I guess the thing is, it really depends on the battery that you've chosen and how important it is for you to have. And I think, <clears throat> to Jenny's point, blackout protection is a, very <clears throat> is a very personal thing. And now, are you talking about in a blackout? No, not in a blackout, just, um, just in general, day to day, I guess, yeah. But well, your, sol your solar and your batteries will either they're either on it or they're not generally with, a, with this type of system, right? So we don't exclude the um, air conditioning circuits from your solar system. If you've got surplus power, your solar system will contribute towards the air conditioner anyway. So it's not like a choice to, it's generally not a choice to include it or exclude it. Um, I, I don't think anyway for a grid connected hybrid system. Your system should be designed to cope with it. What you should have though, is you should have some good design guidelines <coughs> to say that we've thought about your air conditioning con you know, use and you, know, you might think, you, you think to put your air, particularly if it's a fairly new unit, you might think to put your air conditioning on during the day even if you're not there and run it for free off your solar versus having it run all night um, discharging a battery. Yeah, radio. okay. So I, we wouldn't connect your battery specifically to your air conditioner because if you did have a blackout, it wouldn't be out of power anyway. Most of them can't do that level, especially if you've got a big stomping three-phase one. Yeah. So your solar panels would, you know, um, energise your home, which also energises your uh, air conditioner. Um, but basically, so the only time the battery would get involved is really if, you're, um, if you've got a blackout. And generally, we wouldn't connect it to an aircon. Yeah. Okay, no worries. Without knowing all the specific details. Yeah. Um, so my first question to both of you, do you do total off-grid? Both of you do? Yeah. You know what, we do some off-grid, but we actually specialise in Grid Connect. So I'm yeah. building at Second Valley, so it will cost me 30000 to get a single phase up to the house. That's actually cheap. Yeah. <laughs> my no, next it door is really. My next door neighbour cost 60000 because they had to yeah. put in a... Yeah. In. So mine's just 30000 So when you start taking in the cost, do you take the cost of... You know, you're talking loans as well. So usually return of investments, are they taken into considerations, the interest that you're paying on? Because a lot of the times when I hear it and then question it, 
the, the price of the, the loan isn't taken into consideration because I don't have 10,000. So it doesn't often get taken in. Um, so the, the next thing is whether I go for battery, total off-grid, or I pay 30,000 and then go on the grid. The VPP, will that help if I then put a battery in there to get that battery's turnover t in time? No, Ooh, 10 years. Yeah, but probably, I mean, it wouldn't be giving you close to the $30,000 investment. Um, we, my personal view is if you are on the grid, stay on the grid. 100%, um, get your battery, not a problem, but don't go off grid because then you're actually, uh, in my opinion, you're cutting off your nose to spite your face. Um, you can be self-sufficient if you want to, if you don't want to, then that's fine, but there are some people who say, no, I'm completely disconnecting. And your situation is different, and so it's really important to do the numbers, you know, um, and see what that $30,000, which is actually, that's probably the cheapest I've ever heard f to get connected. See what else that is going to give you as well and whether it's worthwhile. When you're calculating your return on investment, ask the company who's giving you the quote. The other things that you need to have a look at, um, particularly for you as well, is not just, um, not just the interest, but for example, and, and as was referenced before, inverters tend to last five years. So put in for the extra cost of that, in, you know, the second inverter if you need to, yeah, for so a solar system as well. So I have very big spreadsheets, yeah, and at good. the moment, the solar doesn't return. Yeah. It's just, you know, it's 55,000, because most of them require, require a large um, generator, because I can't put an air conditioner. As soon as I put an air conditioner into the mix, then that blows everything out of the water. Yeah. And also, I want an electric vehicle. So you both do, do complete off-grid, and you both do on grid, so it's just about the calculations. Yep. And does yep. VPP help a bit in the future? What it would are you help talking a little about? bit, but we don't know what the kind of re extra returns you would get at this stage, really. Um, and how far are you? No, you wouldn't lose a lot from that. Seventy um, kilometres away from the. Too, um, too early to tell what kind of uh, advantage you'd get from the VPP. They just haven't released any information at all. That's the challenge. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Do you want to add anything? So putting in the um, kinds of uh, systems we're talking about in the home battery scheme, it looks as though they're going to take quite a bit of information about you personally. Uh, how much information are they going to be getting from you? Um, how crucial is it to privacy? And what sort of controls do they then put on your battery? I mean, it seems that they can then, if you sign up to this scheme and you sign up to being part of the virtual power plant, it seems that they can then decide when to take uh, energy out of your battery and how much. What sort of controls do you have on that? And how much can they suck out? I'm just thinking in terms of, you know, oh, there's been a power failure. They decide that they're going to uh, put some energy into the grid from all of the batteries that they've got accessible to. And just when you need your energy from your battery, you're going to find some of it gone. Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, so I've got an example of a Redback um, uh, offering um, with a, with a Energy Australia VPP. So you, uh, the first thing you touched on with privacy, it's really important to these providers that um, they, they use your information because actually it's pretty easy to work out when you've left the house and probably when you return home, just as one very simple thing. So people don't always want that getting out. Um, so it's a really good point, and I think you know as these as these guys enter this market space, you know you'll start to see more and more talk about privacy. But Energy Australia, I know, um, make a big deal about it, um, and and how they you can find out from them how well your privacy is protected, and it's pretty well protected. Yeah, most of those can get hacked. Um, so, but what sort of information do they need from you? Uh, what how, how detailed sort of information do they need? Well, really what they need is they need to know the state of charge of your battery. Um, and then, but then as virtual power plants become smarter, you will enter into new arrangements that, that haven't even been thought of yet. But typ typically it might be something like this, that if you've got surplus solar, um, uh, they, you might be able to offer that to the virtual power plant provider for X price. If you've got um, power in your battery and they need it, you might be able to offer it for that for X price. You will also be able to limit the um, depth of discharge on that battery that they'll be able to take. So you might say, I always want 20% of my battery kept for myself to protect me in a blackout um, event. 
And if they take the rest of it and take you down to zero, great, because probably they're paying you more than what power would cost otherwise. So you're not, no one's going to argue that point while you're still connected to the grid, right? So I think, I think uh, overall, um, you will benefit from a virtual power plant in nearly every step of the uh, arrangement because otherwise you won't sign up to it and you'll just go sign up to AGLs. That'll be just around the corner and that'll be the next offer, right? And, and I think what you've got to realise is this is where the income stream um, really comes into play for the future of the energy retailers and it's important that they have offerings that are palatable to you. And with these schemes, you can put in an absolute baseline and say no more than 50% of my battery can go and they can't take any more than that. Is that correct? Well, not with every scheme, but um, I've already know of some that have. So if that's a requirement that you have, then you would hang out. And I don't forget, as Jenny said, no one is compulsorily um, obliged to enter into a virtual power plant with anyone. So you don't have to do anything. You can just say, no, nah, I'm not interested in VPP till I find one that I like. The criteria for, I mean, some people like blue cars and some like yellow, they won't buy a blue car, they'll just wait for the yellow one. You might just say, I'm going to wait for someone to give me the criteria that I want. I want um, to control my minimum depth of discharge and I want, I don't know, I don't want, to, I want my data protected and I don't want them knowing any more than X, Y and Z. So say you sign up with one company, you decide they're no good, you want to move over. Now that uh, the meters are now owned by the electricity company, and I'm in the position, you know, before even putting batteries or solar panels on or anything like that, where I'm needing to actually connect a, basically a granny flat through to an existing box on the wall. Um, it's my understanding that the, the company you sign up with, Black Energy Australia, now owns the meter. And then if you want to change companies to AGL or whatever, they can actually come and get their meter off and AGL will then put their meter on in your meter box. So this to me looks like it's a, a means of actually slowing down your ability to actually transfer energy providers. Is this also likely to be a case with your battery system, I imagine, if you decide you don't want like that deal and you want to go that deal with that company, are they actually going to come over and actually change your meters? Because they, the previous company owns your meter, your next company doesn't own that meter, What's the situation? Yeah, How it's a really work? good point. What's interesting, actually, as I've seen plenty of people move um, retailers in this short time since um, we started last December, and the meters aren't being changed over because meters are being provided by, in a lot of cases, by third-party meter providers okay. anyway, who have arrangements with multiple energy companies. And it really doesn't make any sense. I mean, these meters aren't actually a cheap item. Um, it really doesn't make any sense um, to be doing ex to, to do it the way that you've described. So I think even the retailers have worked out. You know what? If we stick with an a meter, we have two or three meter providers on our list um, that we work with and that we're prepared to get data from. If you switch from Origin to AGL, and AGL probably, I mean, they're very happy if that meter stays on, and that's often what is the case so that I'm that I'm actually seeing at the moment. Oh, good. I mean, I'm seeing both, but I'm seeing more of uh, more of the meters staying on. Um, and the retailers signing up to multiple meter providers. Good. And you raised a good point about data. Most of the data that you're probably worried about, you're already giving to your retailer right now. So there's really not much more data you're giving? Well, you're going to give them a state of charge of your battery and probably a few other bits and pieces, but really right. not much else. All right. Thank you. Are you okay for another 10, ten minutes? <laughs> sure. Right. I am. Jenny? Okay, okay we'll make, uh, there's a bit of lull in proceedings. We may be finishing fairly soon if, if there aren't any more questions. However, um, Eric Rodder is the contact person of the Adelaide Electric Vehicle Association. Would you like to just grab the microphone from um, Eddie there and uh, tell us about your next meeting? Yes, I'm the, uh, my name's Eric and I'm the secretary of the Adelaide branch of the Electric Vehicle Association. Um, we're having a meeting this Wednesday night, two, da two nights time. Uh, we're having a um, guest speaker is uh, Senator Tim Storer. He's um, the chairman of the Senate committee looking into electric vehicles, and uh, which is nearly coming to an end. They're, they're going to do the final report, I think, on December the 4th. So um, if you want to come along, it's, it's held at the Vogue Theatre 
um, which is on Belair Road. And it's in the northern, um, northern, uh, what do you call it? The yeah, northern side of the of the building, and you can park on either the northern side or the southern side. But you entered from the northern car park. Um, it's um, the meeting starts at 7:30, but get there before that to to get a seat. And um, for visitors, it's just a cost of four dollars. Uh, members are free. And um, so, yeah, if you want to come along, Wednesday night, 7 for 7.30, and uh, we'll see you there. Thanks. And we now come to the time that everyone's been looking forward to. I shall do the usual sexist thing and ask Jenny to um, pick the... Sorry? Uh, oh. Standing for men's rights. Could you pick and could, could you read it out, please? It is C35, blue. C35. You have. Oh, that, that's decent here. C77. C77. Do you have a copy already? Sorry? Right. Okay. Um, uh, C70. I feel like I'm at bingo. <laughs> Okay, some general announcements. Um, just get my crib. This is our last meeting for the year. The next meeting will be February, and that will be our annual meeting, which um, includes the re-election of committees, so we're asking for any nominations for convener and committee to be made in the, in the next three months. Uh, Couple of points. The Adelaide Sustainable Building Network. Uh, I've got various events coming up. Check their website for for details. Um, if you're looking for a present for the person who's got absolutely everything, buy them a solar panel for the uh, for Nice Timor family via the ATA. Check in Renew magazine. Um, Fifty dollars for a panel, or three hundred dollars for a complete solar system for, for home. Oh, also the ATA has a, Renew rather, has a um, thermal imaging camera which is ideal for looking for um, blind, um, empty spots in the insulation of your uh, walls and ceiling. It's available at a very modest higher fee by the day to ATA members. If you're not an ATA member, then grab a copy of Renew magazine and um, find out how to join. And talking of that, who is who has come along to their first meeting of the um, ATA or Renew? Uh, Maxine and Catherine will be giving free copies of Renew magazine. Are you coming around now, Catherine, or shall people grab them from the door? Ah. Okay, it's a bargain to join. What, what is it? Seventy dollars a year, seventy-five dollars a year. Anyhow, we our, uh, we have four meetings like this a year. Everyone's got a present guest presenter. Not generally up to this standard, except when it has been one of these two people doing the the presentation but it'll be on a, a topic related to sustainable living, energy efficiency, renewable energy. And if you've got any ideas for topics or site visits, then give me a, an email afterwards. 
Um, I'll just ask a couple of Dorothy Dixers to give people some thinking time, otherwise we'll... Uh, oh, beg your pardon. Yes. Uh, I'm aware it's getting quite late, but uh, um, I'm having second thoughts about that offer for an explanation about AC and DC. Was that connected batteries? Because I thought at first it was connected solar panels. I'm happy to talk to you about it after, if you like. Okay. I'll grab you straight after. Okay, a couple of um, Dorothy Dixers. Reposit power. Could someone explain what reposits are, what their system does, and uh, give, give a few thoughts about it? And another one, many years ago it used to be uh, a great idea that we'll all have electric cars and we'll drive them home and they'd be fully charged and we'd be running our cars off the battery of an electric car. I think that's been put to bed, but could you just um, give, a, give a comment on, on that? I didn't catch the last one. Sorry, Alan. Uh, oh, you can. Yeah. Uh, yep. Right, well, uh, what was the first one? Uh, oh, Reposit. Re yep. Okay. Uh, Reposit. Great company. Uh, great people. Australian design. Uh, effectively, they're a monitoring platform, so they're a, they're a small um, monitoring device that goes into your meter box and it measures your consumption of your home, measures um, anything else that you'd like, measures also um, what your solar's doing. So it is an app that tells you whether your solar's working or not, but it also can be used to turn on appliances or to time things or to um, enable a virtual power plant. So it also measures the state of charge of the batteries that it's compatible with as well. And that's the main point of difference with Reposit. There are a lot of other monitoring systems out there. Solar Analytics is an example, um, another great Australian um, company, but they don't man measure a state of charge of your battery, so they wouldn't be a suitable um, device for uh, a VPP-enabled um, battery system, as an example. So that's Reposit. They, they also trade. They give you the option to trade power if you actually want to do that yourself. Yeah, so that's exactly right. Reposit also has that option, like a VPP. You can um, go with the, who's their retailer? Is it Diamond? I think. I think their retailers. Yeah, I think they've, um, Diamond was their first retailer. I'm not sure who else they use, um, but they will. Um, they can uh, enable discharge of your battery in things that they call a grid event, and a grid event is when the grid needs your battery, and um, you, you get rewarded uh, for those grid events through your electricity bill. Um, the second question was about, I think it was just about the real life viability of discharging your um, car battery into your home at night. Is that really what it was about? Yeah, it's still being talked about. I think um, it's certainly came up, come up in the um, DER group uh, at SAPN as something that um, is still being spoken about. I know that it's uh, it's possible, like it's doable. It's but I think it's um, it's fraught with danger if you just give everybody the, the the open opportunity to discharge whatever they like whenever they like. But at the same time, I think again. Having a VPP-enabled device in your home will make it easy um, uh, for you to participate in this. I think what we're going to see is VPP-enabled, um, uh, I guess, switching gear, which will enable you to um, involve your car. Your car might be approved device at one stage. It's certainly not something that's being approved right now, but it is something that, you know, I can just see it. It's a transportable storage device, exactly what Jenny said. There's, there's absolutely no reason to exclude uh, an electric um, vehicle from a virtual power plant. It, it'll just be something that, I guess, as electric vehicles pick up in, we, we, you know, we need to get about 50,000, 40, 50,000 batteries in homes to really get the big kicker out of a virtual power plant. I imagine there's probably some critical number with electric vehicles that were that were off at some point in time, but I, I, I wouldn't surprise be surprised to see it happening over the next three or four years. Thank you. Okay, if there are no qu more questions, please thank Eddie and Jenny and Finn in absent here. <laughs> Have you already got one of these?
Okay, if there be no more questions, thanks for all coming. Uh, tea, coffee. Oh, Maxine. Just before everybody gets up and goes and helps themselves to tea and coffee, and just a couple of things. Um, part of the membership is is Saturday night, and it's free. Um, and it's Uh, thank you, Martine, and thank you for um, <laughs> thanks for my birthday cake there to signify. Yes, sorry, to everybody, we won't make you sing Happy Birthday, but Alan, who has been a long, long time convener for the APA slash Renew, he actually got this group started. Like, was it 50 years ago, Alan? <laughs> 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 okay. Tw Twenty-five. <laughs> The appropriate reaction is you don't look that old. <laughs> okay, thank you for all attending. See you next, next year. <laughs>